We are looking at the story of Cain and Abel in the book of Genesis, chapter 4. And why are we looking at this story? Mallory? Because we want to let the firstborn son go to the father and sacrifice. Yeah? Yes, and determining which is the firstborn son. And I will say this, that this pretty much this whole book of Genesis, <clears throat> and for sure starting right here, is different stories about determining who the firstborn is in the eyes of God. And so we discover that all of our all of our uh, conceptions of that. Um, for example, with David, you have all those brothers going before him, and oh, that's got to be this one, and oh, this one's this one's tall, and oh, this one's skinny, and this one's whatever. <clears throat> um, all of it, human perception and conceptions. That's where Saul came from. He was taller than everybody else. And, um, and David was the youngest and ended up being one of the dearest to the heart of the Father and to the heart of God. <clears throat> um, so much so that Jesus was even called the son of David. I mean, you know, we, we hear that, we know that. But do we ever take it out of the, the, the context of Israel's history and put it into the context of the Father's heart? Um, because he was one after God's heart, and that's, that's just a fact. Okay. So from that, we are looking for that which touches God's heart. We're looking for that which touches God's heart. And the good thing is, is that we're going to have story after story that will show this from different angles. We will see the preference of God. We will see the, we will see the preferences of man. Um, and in going through this, we are not just trying to learn stories from the book of Genesis. We want to see here and, <clears throat> and realizing, you know, realizing that um, in Exodus that departure from Egypt involved Israel and then the firstborn. Two different groups with two different tasks, two different groups with two different agendas from God. God was incredibly merciful, and he said of Israel, you know, I've heard your cries, and I've come down to deliver you and, and to take them to the land of promise. But the firstborn was not going to the land of promise. It was going to the heart of God to be a sacrifice. That was their goal, and that could happen anywhere, whether it's in the wilderness. It was supposed to happen in the wilderness, and therefore... The trip was supposed to be very, very different, but um, the firstborn didn't come through, and Israel just acted like Israel, just people that got delivered but didn't get free from themselves. So we, with that sort of an eye, we want to look at Cain and Abel. We want to look at their story. So uh, Genesis chapter 4, and beginning with verse 1, and Adam knew Eve, his wife, and she conceived and bare Cain and said, I have gotten a man from the Lord. And she again bare his brother Abel, and Abel was a keeper of sheep, but Cain was a tiller of the ground. And in process of time it came to pass that Cain brought of the fruit of the ground an offering unto the Lord. And Abel he also brought of the firstlings of his flock and of the fat thereof, and the Lord had respect unto Abel and to his offering. 
But unto Cain and to his offering, he did not have respect. He, he did not look with favor. And Cain was very wroth, and his countenance fell. And the Lord said unto Cain, Why art thou wroth, and why is thy countenance fallen? If thou doest well, shalt thou not be accepted. And if thou doest not well, sin lieth at the door. And unto thee shall be his desire, and thou shalt rule over him. And Cain talked with Abel, his brother, and it came to pass when they were in the field that Cain rose up. There's a resurrection right there. He rose up, but it's the wrong kind, isn't it? It's the old leaven rising up. <clears throat> against, notice the word, rose up, against Abel, his brother, and slew him. All right, all those words there in that last part are indictments against him because of his motives, because of his way. Um, John talks a lot about this in 1 John, a lot, and even brings up, you know, uh, we have no clue. We just go, well, yes, we're all Christians, um, but that one my brother or sister uh, I have offense with because they're not you know what I perceive as respectable uh, whereas in our heart we have our own preferences and we have ought and it manifests itself in things such as this so the basic storyline is that Adam and Eve had two sons. And don't forget, their father is Adam. <clears throat> and don't forget that Eve is their mother. And um, when Cain, he was obviously first born. And um, of course, there was, there was joy. There was joy. There was jubilation when Cain was born, and, and uh, she said, I have gotten a man from the Lord. But when Abel was born, there was nothing said, okay? And um, let's see. So it, when it mentions their occupation, <clears throat> it says that in verse uh, 1 and 2, let's see. Three. And in process of time it came to pass that Cain brought of the fruit of the ground an offering unto the Lord. In verse 4, and Abel also brought of the firstlings of the flock and the fat thereof. Okay. So um, we have an example of offering the firstborn. But I want you to notice something. Something that maybe you didn't notice. When it says Cain's offering, it says that Cain brought of the fruit of the ground. It didn't say the first fruit. It didn't say the first fruit. Um, I'll read that. I'll read that in just a minute where the, it's located in Exodus. Abel kept sheep while Cain was a tiller of the ground. Possible reasons for uh, so so when it's talking about the sacrifice Abel is put first Abel is mentioned before Cain when it came to the sacrifice okay and I wrote possible reason for placing Abel first might be that the first family may have learned sacrifice and conceived the idea from God covering Adam and Eve with skins after the fall and in Genesis 3:21, it says this, Unto Adam also and to his wife did the Lord God make coats of skins and clothe them. And, of course, anyone can argue <clears throat> that, you know, I mean, they obviously came off an animal. You could say they were roadkill or something, and God chose them and, and did that. Uh, they died of natural causes. Or God is into sacrifice. 
can say that. It doesn't say here, but then the whole Bible from here on out is dealing with sacrifice, including Jesus, his son. So, um, Cain merely carried out the occupation of those under the curse. And this is, uh, what have we got here? We, um, Genesis 3, 17 and 19 says, And unto Adam he said, Cursed is the ground for thy sake. In sorrow shalt thou eat of it all the days of thy life. Thorns also and thistles shall it bring forth to thee. And thou shalt eat the herb of the field. In the sweat of thy face shalt thou eat bread till thou return unto the ground. For out of it wast thou taken. For dust thou art and unto dust thou shalt return. <clears throat> okay, so, so a little bit of things there. Um, number one, this, this new project of having to till the ground wasn't that way in the Garden of Eden. The way God had it there, there was a nice mist that watered everything and you know, the fruit just grew naturally and all this kind of stuff. But now, you know, you are in a position, you put yourself in a position where you're going to have to work. You know, you're going to have to produce. You're not going to, you never accepted everything that came up freely. So let's see how you do. This is just like the law. I mean, it's like the law. <clears throat> um, you know, thou shalt, thou shalt not, you know, do, do all this. And... Um, uh, the sweat of thy brow you shall eat bread till thou return into the ground. And of course, we're just talking here about Adam, who was made from the dust of the ground. Okay. So this is, um, this is an interesting um, uh, reality when you think about it. <clears throat> Jumping ahead a little bit, but when you think about it, Cain was not only the firstborn, but he was the firstborn. First person ever born. So you'd think that'd be a big deal, and certainly it was to his parents. And we'll, we'll, we'll get into that in just a second. Um, so they're going to sacrifice, the brothers are going to sacrifice, and, and um, you know, Adam and Eve, they're rejoicing. Uh, here is a, a, an area that they can get back in touch with God because they had been separated from the Lord. <clears throat> I don't know if that means anything to you, but if you've ever gone through a period of time where you felt separated from the Lord, it's kind of refreshing when you get anything, <laughs> you know, even the slightest. You know, you're, you're you know, to the, to the hungry, every, what is it, something thing is sweet. Every bitter thing is sweet. Praise God. Um, uh, they uh, may rejoice in the revelation concerning sacrifice because it maintains a link with God in the midst of deep failure. But while the first family may rejoice in the revelation concerning sacrifice because it maintains a link with God in the midst of deep failure, yet, and here's that thing that you shared with me I wrote in here, yet consider the deep grief of God who has to endure sacrifices of sheep and goats in place of relating to us by the tree of life. They left the Garden of Eden with skins on their backs which spoke of hope but they also left the tree of life behind, you know. All right. Um, this, this gets into just a huge area of what the Lord would like to deal with us over, to break some things, to, to give us a new view. And I uh, uh, was talking with somebody about it today and just this thing of uh, we are just so, so, so focused on sin and failure and what, you know, how, how I need the Lord. And when you say that, this, you know, these areas, I, I really need the Lord. Um, but you're talking about goats and, you know, sheep. You're talking about offerings again. You're talking about um, 
your need is, is based on your problems, which keep you focused on yourself. And if that's not enough, the devil comes and messes with you. And the devil is really good at messing with you to make you be focused back down here on him or you in relationship to him. And all of that is just a distraction and it's a sleight of hand trick by the enemy. And it, it uh, takes us off of the tree of life, looking into the face of Jesus. It takes us away, it, it makes us self-conscious and you know Hebrews talks about all this it makes us self-conscious we become self-conscious in the midst of all of this and so we say you know I, I understand the, the the thinking so we say um, well you know so uh, God wants us to focus on that but I'm still messing up I'm still sinning and I'm still doing this well Pretty much if you continue to focus on yourself, you'll do that the rest of your life. There has to be a time when you go, Lord, I'm going to trust you with all of this, but I'm not going to use it as an excuse. I am not going to just, you know, go, well, praise God. I am going to trust you with all of this while I pursue your face. And um, so what's going to happen when you do that? The enemy's going to come. He's going to try to do this again. He's going to bring up this. He's going to condemn you. He's going to wake you up in the night and tell you, tell you what a terrible person you are. Well, you know, um, you, you remember the story in Mardi Gras when somebody came to me and said, I hate all this sin here. It's horrible. I hate it. I, I can't love these people. And I said, you're not here to give them your love. You're here to give them Jesus' love. That's, that's, that's why you're here. That's why we're here, and, and we're not here to give them our perfection, and we're not here to give the Lord our perfection, amen? Because we don't have any, <laughs> you know? But we do have it, it's called Jesus. It's called God's firstborn son, that if we're, okay, so, so just picture this. Um, oh gosh, you know, there's, I'm, there's so many places I can go with this. <clears throat> Um, uh, so, you know, let's go to the prodigal son because that one's a never fail template. You know, you've got, you've got the elder son and he is just bitter and he is upset because he's not being chosen as the firstborn. And, and the final nail, if you forgot, the final nail in the coffin was when God said to him, Child, it says son in the King James, but that word is tiknon, which is child. You are not a mature son. Um, all I have is yours, but you're griping over, over what you want instead of what I have. See, you are, you're not content with me and what I have coming unto me, finding me, because the prodigal did at the altar, amen? amen? He found him. He discovered the father. And, and you know, he said, you know, I'm no, no more worthy, you know? So everything, every drop that you get that comes from him does not come by worthiness. It comes by the grace of his heart. Not the grace of God, the grace of his heart. Because the grace of God is a phrase we use to glorify grace instead of God. Um, so you have both of them, prodigal son story, both, both the sons born into the family. Amen. They're both in the family. He is the father of both of them. But you have those scriptures that we gave. You remember those scriptures that describe, uh, uh, beloved, behold what manner of love that you are called the sons of God, but it does not yet appear in you. But when the sun appears in you, then, see, and Galatians, you know, and because you are sons, God sent forth the Son into your heart, crying, Abba, Father. He's not trying to get us to cry, Abba, Father. 
And any attempt at doing that is going to not be, he knows the sound of his son, you know. Um, so there's, uh, we, we say there's the, the evil elder son, and then there's the prodigal son who did bad. But, you know, now he's with the father. And then we say there's the firstborn, the son of the father's love. And we go, okay, well, I choose the son of the father's love because they're bad or they messed up, sin, sin focus. The father doesn't look like that. He doesn't look that way. He's not looking at their sin. He's looking at their lack of the son. I'm, I'm telling you, he's looking at their lack of the firstborn in them, and he doesn't see that son. He's not seeing sin. Sin's been, the, you know, the blood covered, you know, covered our sin and stuff like that. It's not uncover every other day. He's saying, let my firstborn go. And we go, Lord, just help me and fix me. And oh, I want to be right with you. And he's going, you'll never be right with me. Let my firstborn son. Where is he? He's in you. Well, how do I get him? You've already got him. Well, I'm working hard to let him go. Stop it. Just seek him. And you, if you look into his face, a different creature is going to be the result of that. The, the difference between the prodigal son and the prodigal son standing there with the father in sacrifice and then eating it and then rejoicing with the father and making merry is just the top glory. It beats heaven. Thy, thy glory is above the heavens. Above it. But we're still down here going, oh, I just want to be right. I just, you know, and see, the Father's very kind. Just thank the Lord I'm not the Father. Because I just slap your little face and say, stop it, stop it, stop it. Get your eyes, lift up your eyes under the hills from which cometh thy help. Your help comes from the Lord, and it's not help with you, it's help from the Lord. You understand? It's not him reaching his hand. It's us being conformed into that image from one glory to the other, from law glory to sun glory. Hallelujah. You know, okay, so has anybody ever heard this before? It seemed like I had a class called Law and Grace not even that long ago, really. Um, but here's the key. So don't, you don't have to be condemned because you never got anything I ever shared. <laughs> I can't recall any of it. <laughs> um, <laughs> <laughs> Here's the deal. It's not about getting what I share. It's not. Okay, okay, I thought about this again. I've used this example a long time ago, but um, when they first got into the tomb of, I think it was King Tut, and they got in there and they found this vase, this jar, this thing, and it had wheat seed in it. And they took that wheat seed out and it had been in there for thousands of years and they planted it. And when they did and put a little water on it, boom! Okay, why am I bringing that story up right now? Because what you share is seeds. Yeah. Yeah, that's exactly right. And so what we do is we get the seeds in us, but you know, it's, it never hurts to pray, Father, make your word unto me as seed, and may I be, you know, and what did Paul call us? You are God's ground, you are his field, cultivated. You know how a field gets cultivated? That's right. You take a plow and you run over the top of it and break up its fallow ground. 
And God is trying to break up our fallow ground. He's, try, he's not trying to teach us. He's trying to just run over the top of us with certain things that'll make us go, oh no, bad, bad enough, bad enough where we'll go, I've already tried this. I am not going to try it in my own flesh anymore. I lift up my eyes to the Lord. Because only the hopeless do that. I feel like we're in church. I'm getting some. Bring it, brother. Yes. Certainly. No. Well, so you look at Abraham, and I'm jumping ahead here, but you know, you look at Abraham, man, and he's, God calls him when he's, you know, totally already basically can't have kids, but maybe, maybe there's always a slight possibility, you know, and so then God waits and waits and waits, and we go, we go, why didn't God do something? I'm serious when I pray, you know? He goes, because I don't like you. No. You're mine, you're mine, you know? And, but, but here's the deal is that it, way down the road, and I can show you, and I will show you when we get to Abraham, I'm gonna show you some really good stuff of his growth process, because it's the faith of Abraham that we need. Yes, amen. Amen. So, um, so there has to be this place where we say, my heart is with you, not with myself. Well, we go, okay. We say, well, I'm not gonna be with me and me to be something special. Well, it's still with you if you're just admitting how bad you are all the time. It's okay to say, I'm nothing, I'm not worthy, but then you have to look in the Father's face and see who is worthy and he's in you. And you say, not I, but Christ. And you say, thank God for the cross. You don't go, don't preach the cross. That hurts my little feelings. Wait a minute, was that little elephant talking there? <laughs> you know, but, but see, he's, you know, he's not afraid to hurt our feelings. Because feeling, we're not supposed to go by feelings anyway. He says that. We walk by faith, not by sight. Our feelings. So there is this, this place where you, when, when the word is going forth, um, you don't say, I'm a Christian. You say, I'm God's cultivated field. Lord, let your seeds fall in me. And then you have to say, bring them up in your timing. Yes. But then you don't go, well, I don't have anything, and I don't remember anything, and I can't, you know, and I've missed all of that teaching, and I'm just a wretched being. No, you're full of seed. And now you need to pray for the rain. Pray for the Spirit of God to bring the rain, the early and the latter rain. <clears throat> and, and it's a, one of the things that you're going to constantly see. We saw it in Esther. You, you see it here in Cain and Abel. It's a situation of approach. She, uh, Esther, could not be there unless she learned the right approach from the Holy Spirit, right? And this whole story is teetering on approach, how you approach, you know? And um, story after story, because how you, and your approach, folks, isn't how you approach prayer. It's how you approach everything with the Lord. But particularly when the word's going forth, you are, you are a prayer yourself. You are already in prayer. You are already saying, Lord, do that work in me. You know, if it's time to, to break up my ground, then bring the plow. But if it's time for the seeds to get in me, then bring the seeds. Or if it's time, the time of the harvest, bring 
forth the, the plants and the, the fruit of that. But you don't know where you're at. And if you, if you assume you know where you're at, you're already off. Seriously, if you assume you are, and every one of us, every man's way is right in his own eyes. Okay, well, then we're all messed up then. But if we get some new eyes, you know, not I, but I am, the I am. We need a whole bunch of new eyes. I am, I am the bread of life. I am the good shepherd. I am, instead of I, and constantly focusing on us, you know? So, approach, approach, approach. Let these times of the word, any time the word, any person that brings forth the word, don't, and here's another thing, and some of you already know this, but, but don't, um, don't be a respecter of preachers. Don't be a respecter of preachers. And here's what I mean. I'm not saying don't respect the leadership or whatever because the Lord says to do that. And, you know, Jim's the pastor. So, um, and here's what, so here's specifically what I mean. When you sit there, it doesn't matter who's talking. Uh, you say, well, I don't get anything out of what they share. Do they ever share scripture? Can you get anything out of the scripture? Not when it comes out of their mouth. What? Do you understand what I'm saying? That's ridiculous. That is ridiculous. We're not honoring the word then. We're, we're dishonoring somebody. We're not honoring the word. We're not saying, you know, uh, usually in a sermon around here, you'll have tons of scriptures go forth. It's usually not a sermon with one scripture. <laughs> you, know, you know what I'm saying? So, so it should be a feast. Whatever comes that is scripture, just say, oh, let that go into this ground. You know, thy word have I hid in my heart that I might not sin against thee. Not my heart has fought the good fight against the devil and I won't sin. No. Anyway, sorry, I'm getting a little crazy here. It's so important. It's so important. Approach. Set it, write it down if you have to. Write it on the front of your Bible in big red letters, approach, and then anytime you go into a service, anywhere, with anybody, anyhow, it, don't, it won't matter one bit, you will start your approach by being good ground without uh, preconceived ideas. Lord, let, it, let the seeds go in me. I don't know what seeds you're even picking. I don't, I don't have a clue. I don't, I don't know where I'm at on the journey. <laughs> I'm just yours. I'm just yours. And he'll go, oh, well, if you're mine. Hallelujah. 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 Lord, just, just get this stuff in us. Get this stuff in us. We're, we're yours. We belong to you. We're your fertile ground. We're your cultivated field. And we ask that the seeds that you put in over the years, that they are still there just like in that tomb in Egypt. And once they get the right soil and the right rain and the right approach, they'll start coming up. So we're, we believe you and we believe that you're in control of the process. And we believe that the last thing we need to do is constantly talk to ourselves or others about how bad we are. Amen. I've said this recently too, and that is that, you know, we, when we say, well, I'm just bad, but Jesus is good, nine times out of ten, we're separate from him. We're talking over here, and I'm bad and pointing over there. Well, can't we say, you know what? I'm bad, but Jesus is in me. 
<laughs> There's hope in that. The other way, it's just continually, it sounds spiritual, but it's not. It is unspiritual. <laughs> it is. Because we're separate. We don't want to be separate. Why do we talk separate? Because we think separate. So then we have to say, I, no, no, no. I, I am a wretch, but I know who shall save me from this deliver me from this thing that is me and that is you and the process is all that you know it's it's all done I mean he finished it all wrapped it all up rose from the dead to, to, to you know stamp the seals for us you know the passports you know you're in you're in I died I, I died for your sin you know you don't have to you don't have to re-die because I died for all that you've already done and will do. Yeah, but I'm so, shut up. <laughs> I didn't, it's been a long time since I preached. <laughs> I teach a lot, but have mercy. And the Lord said. <laughs> <laughs> Amen. Um, so, um, I said, uh, meanwhile, let us go back to our storyline. At first sight, the story appears to be merely that of two brothers who are on the same day uh, uh, offering sacrifices to God. However, as we shall see, the events surrounding sacrifice actually become the occasion in which God chooses his firstborn. All right. Um, down here below, I talk about altar favor. Altar favor. Altar favor. You need to start considering that instead of calling it just the grace of God. Altar favor. We'll get into it. I've got it down here. I just was trying to prepare you a little bit, and then I got all these weird looks. What the heck is that? <laughs> it's favor that comes when you're coming from the altar. <clears throat> um, In the natural, Cain was the absolute firstborn of all creation. The firstborn of all creation. And you know it says that of Jesus, don't you? Yes. But he was the firstborn of all creation. Neither Adam nor Eve came about by natural birth. He was favored even before Abel was actually born. He was favored. He was. He was considered the firstborn. And he was favored. <clears throat> uh, Adam and Eve were the first parents to have a, to, to love a child. And his name was Cain. The first parents to ever love a child. And they were so happy with Cain. God said, go and multiply. Well, it's on. It's on, and here it is, and I've, I've gotten a man from the Lord, okay? So there, are, there is this, this joy, this, um, let's see if I've got how that's written. No other child had ever existed, therefore all the favor and attention came to Cain alone. Man, oh man. So, so what do you think is going on in their heart when it says, from your seed, Eve, they're going, this must be the firstborn, the firstborn of all creation. Mm, no, don't do that. Don't, don't jump to conclusions. <clears throat> So all the attention came to Cain, <clears throat> and when the time came for sons, I put it in parenthesis, when the time came for sons to offer, 
it was important to Adam and Eve after being ejected from the garden to finally find favor with God again. We're going to offer and we're going to find favor with God and God's going to smile on us again. Oh, only someone who's been in a dry desert knows how wonderful that would be. All right, so let's, let's talk about the sacrifices. So obviously they both brought different sacrifices. Um, <laughs> I just looked at my notes. Uh, I wrote down, when it comes to offerings, which does God favor most? Is it animal or vegetable? <laughs> and then I put, God is not a vegetarian. That's a joke. Okay. <laughs> I wrote that's a joke in here. Because surely this, this paper will get out somewhere and be published and they'll go, what the heck is this guy? <laughs> Excuse me while I drink. Cain offered God his sacrifice from the cursed ground. Notice that it does not say he brought the first fruits, but only fruit of the ground. Consider that in light of what we have studied in Exodus concerning God claiming the firstborn as his own. And, uh, so Exodus 22, you don't have to turn there, but 22, uh, 29 through 30 says, Thou shalt not delay to offer the first of thy ripe fruit, the first of thy ripe fruit, and of thy, um, well, mine, this version says liquors. The first of thy sons shalt thou give unto me. So offering the first ripe fruit is representative of offering to God his firstborn son. Unto God Abel offered firstborn lambs hmm. and the fat thereof. They, this, the scripture says here they were the firstlings of the flock. Having just looked at Exodus concerning God's demand for his firstborn son in the form of the first fruits, now let's see that truth in relationship to the firstlings of the flock. This is Exodus 13 verse 12 and also chapter 20, uh, 34, 19, that, <clears throat> that thou shalt set apart unto the Lord all that openeth the womb, and every firstling that cometh of a beast which thou hast, the male shall be the Lord's, and all that openeth the womb is mine, and every firstling among the cattle, whether ox or sheep, that is male. So, um, you remember it says, and God looked with favor uh, upon Abel and his sacrifice. <clears throat> In fact, that's what I have right here. And the Lord had respect unto, or looked up with favor upon Abel and his offering, but unto Cain and to his offering he had not respect. So God is responding now to not just the offering, but the offerer. Um, you do remember that the offerings were always in representative of the offerer. If you came and you had a sin offering, that's the heat died for you. This is, this is all things that we are meant to be tied in to the offering and, and understand that whatever we're offering, this is what God wants. But this also represents me, you see. So this is, <clears throat> this is one of the reasons why um, the scriptures are so adamant about identification that you be identified in him, with him, of him, 
because that, that was done 2,000 years ago at the cross. He settled that then. Your job, your goal, your goal, your goal is to get where you no longer think of yourself without thinking of Jesus. So my question is, is that too much to ask? <laughs> that should be every Christian, every believer, that should be our pursuit. Okay, so now if we're honest with ourselves, then we will admit that probably most of us are not there. Uh, we may be there in relationship to religious things, church services, stuff like that. Um, but maybe work or family life, maybe uh, when we fail, maybe our minds immediately, uh, our mind won't say this, but it is saying this. Our minds will immediately say the cross didn't happen, Jesus didn't make me one, uh, he was not raised from the dead and I was raised in him. I'm separate. Which is um, looking with disrespect upon the offering that Jesus offered. Not looking with favor on his sacrifice when God does. When God does. Um, okay, but see, the reason why we do that is because we're very righteous people. We're very spiritual. Well, I wouldn't want to say that I'm something when I'm not. Okay, what is your basis of saying you're not that? Well, I do stuff, and I say stuff, and I act this way. What is God's basis of saying you are? Jesus died, bought and paid for it, and said, come, enter in. <clears throat> we're, when we do that, we're not spiritual. And we're not honoring Jesus' sacrifice. And we are uh, holding our ground in an old creation. If any man be in Christ, well, I don't, I don't know if I'm in Christ. Well, he said you are. Yeah, but my mind is greater than his. The way I think is more important than what he says. No, of course, you'd never say that, but you, you act that way. And, your mind, and you, you put your mind before his mind. But he says, your thoughts are not my thoughts. But he also says, let this mind be in you. <laughs> your thoughts are not my thoughts. But let this mind be in you. But don't let your mind, let your thoughts come against my thoughts. Let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus. Do you see the, the, there really shouldn't be a battle there. He's on our side and we're supposed to be on his side. Amen? I mean, there really shouldn't be a battle. Uh, it should be, um, there was an old saying people would say, God said it, I believe it, that settles it. Well, that's too simple. No. No. He's exalted his word above his name. We need to exalt it above our name. You know? We need to be with him. This is the way I think. This is what he's saying when he's, he, he puts the word to us like that. This is what I'm saying. This is what I say. You need to be with me in this. Um, well, I want to, but I, I'm focused on me, and I'm, I'm not worthy. He's going, boy, you sure right about that. Not because of all your sin, but because you won't get with me. When, when will we break and say, I just want to be with you. I just want to be with you, Father. I, I admit it. I have put my thoughts before you, and I've let them guide my life. But I want, I want, I want to be with you. Yeah. 
Oh, I can just feel the Spirit of God witnessing, bearing witness to that right now. I hope you can. He's just right here. You do realize he's right here. And he just, I just, I mean, I can feel his presence. I see, he is bearing witness right now. The goal isn't to meditate on what's wrong, but on him. But if he says, you got this wrong with you, then, then say, okay, I'm with you in that too. You know what I'm saying? And then he'll work it out. But if you don't ever own up to it, then he can't do anything with you. So just let the Spirit of God come down. Let the Spirit of God breathe Christ in you. And let the Spirit of God uh, nudge you, because he does me all the time, nudge you and say, nah, you can't say that. He does it to me all the time. I, I think something, like that. no, that's not correct. And he'll reword it the correct way. And I'll go, oh, that's a lot better. That's that's the that's that's right because you you can your he your spirit bears witness with the Holy Spirit or the Holy Spirit bears witness with that. There's this give and take that's going on, and you're going, I, yes, yes, and it's freedom. It's not bondage. Doesn't matter. You know, I mean, the Lord sometimes. Well, whom the Lord loves, He chastens. Do you agree with that? No, do you agree that he loves you when you're getting chastened? That's the question. <laughs> I, I snuck up on you with that one, didn't I? <laughs> yes. Well, that's for sure, you know. I mean, that's absolutely for sure. He, uh, you know, the father wants his firstborn son. If he has a choice between you and his firstborn son, he's always going to pick the firstborn. <laughs> so if you're like me, you go, well, what about me? And he goes, what about you? <laughs> you know? I said, well, what am I just, and he goes, no, you're in the firstborn. And, but the key is, the key is, and the key is in, in this story and in everyone we cover from Genesis on here, the key is, is that that firstborn son needs to take over us. Christ in you. God's hope. We always say, that's my hope. It's his hope. He's hoping that you will no longer just be a called son, but when that which you know appears, then you should be like him. It'll be his life, his nature. I mean, we stop it, beloved. You know. You know. <laughs> you should feel pretty good because you're called the son of God. And we go, well, I am. Thank you. And then shut the Bible. He said, but it doth not yet appear. He says, so we go, well, when, when is he going to appear? And he said, well, when are you going to let his appearing come? Then you should be like it. See, the goal isn't just to be a called son, called a son. I'm, you're, you know, you're a son. The goal is the firstborn son and letting him appear. Where are we at here? <clears throat> so he showed um, favor to Abel and didn't to Cain and I wrote how significant is this first it is significant to the parents in a negative way and then it is significant to the heart and desire of God in a positive way first let us consider the parents what dread did Adam and Eve feel, and how greatly could they identify when Cain was rejected by God? For them, it was a reoccurring nightmare that they had never wished to repeat. The one that they believed to be the firstborn had been rejected by God just the way they were. 
What they did not realize at the moment was that God had it all in hand and they would soon line up with his view of the situation. Abel. And I will say dead Abel. Did I throw you a curve? We'll discuss it. And then, but there is, a, there is another great significance that we have not yet addressed. I'm not merely speaking in terms of their personal lives and relations with God, but has there been a shift that has taken place here that is fundamental to the theme of God getting his firstborn son? Has Abel suddenly been recognized by God as the beloved son? And I want you to register that phrase because it's going to be used a lot from now on. The, Beloved son, the beloved son. The beloved son is the firstborn, and the firstborn is always designated for death. The beloved son is the firstborn, and the firstborn is always designated to death, so that when the heavens opened and God said, this is my beloved son, he was saying, he's going to go into death. When Abel got acknowledged as the firstborn and the beloved son, he went into death. You, you, need to, you need to not just recognize the patterns, but let the Spirit of God start building something in us as we go. I mean, we've got, a, we've got some wonderful, wonderful, incredible ground to cover, but we don't want to just cover ground. These things are going to be said over and over, and if we have them going forward, we can build something, and God can build something in us that relates to this son being formed. So approach. How are you approaching? Keep approaching the way that, that you should. So let me try to finish this. this um, Uh, and has the approval of God, and and has the approval of God to Abel and his sacrifice not merely been a one-time show of favor, but represents an act by God similar to when Jesus came out of the Jordan River when he said, "This is my beloved Son, in whom I am well pleased." We have no record of God having shown favor as to who was the firstborn in His eyes before the time of the sacrifices. As a general rule, when it comes to God's choice for the firstborn, the altar becomes the great revealer. The altar becomes the great revealer. You look for the altar. If you're going to talk firstborn, then look for the altar, because it's going to be there. Even so, at this time, all was determined in the process of the sons presenting their offerings to God. It was then that God took note of Abel. It was at that point that the yet living Abel became the beloved son. And once you do that, then you have to, there's going to be a, a death. A, Give me my firstborn son. It was at that point that the yet living Abel became the beloved son when his sacrifice found favor with God. It pleased him. Because Abel humbled himself and gave God a lamb, God exalted him in his view. Abel's favor was shown to him while at the altar. It is altar favor, and not merely favor because you're special, but favor on any level leads to not altar favor, but altar death, which we know it did. Father, we just thank you for everything that's in your heart toward your son that we want to line up with we want to be with you in it we don't want to be be with the teacher in a class we want to be with you in this great thing that you're doing in our midst and and spreading forth your heart it, it seems like at a time when maybe we should be more condemned you're spreading forth your heart you're so wonderful you're so glorious but it is you're showing your great love for your beloved son. Oh, 
all types and shadows until the Jordan River. And then you said, there he is. There he is. I'm the father and that's my beloved son. And he will carry out the role of a firstborn. And he will do it rightly and he'll do it in the right spirit. Oh, how, Father, your heart must have rejoiced at that Jordan and, the, and then at the cross because you knew what was coming forth. Hallelujah. We love you, Father. We love you, Jesus. Thank you. We love you, Holy Spirit. Keep us, keep us flowing in the right direction. Keep us open. Keep us humble. Keep us lowly and you will lift us up. Thank you. Thank you. In Jesus' name. Amen. All right. Well.